Some work's done by horses, some gets done by windmills, on the walls machines... What we want to do, we want to show the people of Lincoln that their heritage should be on a roundabout in Lincoln. Lincoln is probably the largest manufacturing centre for aircraft in the First World War, in Britain at least. And then all of a sudden, they find themselves lugging great huge pieces of tank or traction engine or, or around or filling up bombs. Imagine going back 100 years ago to 1914. The world was a very different place. Many European empires were at their zenith, including the British Empire. And domestically, women were expected to stay at home and look after the house and children. The county of Lincolnshire was a hub of agricultural machinery production. But with the onset of World War I, the tensions of the interwar period, and with the conclusion of World War II, this all changed. Empires started to disintegrate, women started to get more rights, and during World War I, Lincolnshire was tasked to create war machines to fight for Britain. Local historian Richard Pullen explains these often drastic changes. Well, it's a huge subject and it's not something that's been covered very much. It's Lincoln and Lincolnshire were, were absolutely full of factories. It often comes as a surprise to people. Lincoln had Clayton and Shuttleworth, Penny and Porter, Dawson's, Ruston's, Foster's, many more besides. And they were, they were all involved in heavy engineering. So when the First World War came along, their expertise in stamping out metal or uh, riveting or, or heavy engineering in general came in handy. And people like Dawson's, who before the war were making leather belts for agricultural machinery, suddenly found themselves making leather belts for officers to wear and, and holsters for guns and that sort of thing. And, and Foster's, who had been doing heavy engineering metal work, riveting and that sort of thing, found themselves actually making tanks and it's, it was sort of a, a natural progression. It was unexpected and it was quite a huge difference from civilian work to military contracts and it, it did often happen overnight for some of them, yeah. When they first started making the tank they weren't doing any large military contracts so they didn't have the badges on the lapels to show that they were exempt from military service. A lot of these men were coming out knowing full well they were making top secret tanks for the war effort, branded as cowards and telling them they should do something useful. I'm a great admirer of the, the munitionettes as they were called because prior to the First World War a lot of women didn't work, they, they got married, they had children, they looked after hearth and home and uh, the women that did work, I think the statistic is, is over 80% in 1913, worked in shops or childcare, that sort of thing. And then all of a sudden they find themselves lugging great huge pieces of tank or traction engine or, or around or filling up bombs and things and it was hard, heavy work. It was heavy work for men who were used to it let alone, you know, ladies of 15 or 16 who had, had probably worked in a shoe shop on the Friday, on the Monday morning, they suddenly had to go and, and do this. Great admirer of, of what they did. And at the end of the war, no medals for them, no credits, they just had to move aside. The men came back, they wanted the jobs back, the economy had to carry on, the country had to carry on, so the women just had to go, and it's, it's such a shame. They never got the credit they deserved. When they were working in, in the factories, they got these uh, little brass triangular... Um, badges to show they were working on war work and at the end of the war these ladies were supposed to give those badges back but you find hundreds and hundreds. These women were so proud of what they did and they knew that that was the only tangible thing they had to show for their work during the First World War that they kept it and they weren't supposed to but they did and, and you do find lots now you see them at antiques fairs and all over the place. So World War I was very much a turning point in local history. But which war machines were made in the Lincolnshire area at this time, and who made them? Jake Shears went to the Lincolnshire archives on St Rumble Street and pondered on the archive material of World War I images in Lincolnshire with archivist Adrian Wilkinson. Uh, this is a photograph album about uh, the Tang, uh, which was uh, designed and built by Foster's. It goes right back to the first Tang, which is Little Willie, in 1915. You can see it outside the factory. It has the tank tracks, but there's no 
tow it on top. Is that the front wheels or the back wheels? And there's the steering wheels with an early Mark One tanks as well, but they got rid of them in later on because, of course, they're very vulnerable to enemy fire. Of course, not many people. I've never seen this before. It's, 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 it looks like just like a tank with no tow on top, and it's got wheels at the back, steering wheels at the back. That's amazing. Uh, this shows a tank being loaded onto a railway wagon. Then. The only thing is when the turrets, side turrets are on the tank, it's actually too wide for the railway tunnels, so they had to remove them before loading it. Oh, I see, they removed the turrets, and then they had to reassemble it. Um, this shows um, a Mark I tank actually being tested in Burton Park, because uh, they were tested on Burton Park and the West Common as well. So. Yeah, I can see the wheels at the back, they are flexible, they go up, go up and down, and um, it looks like they got rid of the steering wheels, managed to fix the steering problems. I think w- what they used to do is like put more speed and more velocity yeah, so in right one track. Um, and that's slow one track down, and that's the way tanks turn. Um, that's how the tanks still turn today. This tank was actually um, paid for by the Malay states, a British colony, and so it's been sort of painted places, places up Places like Malaysia... It, um, lots of modern day Malaysia, yeah. And so it's got uh, little eyes painted on the side. So. <laughs> Is it to scare the enemy, maybe, or...? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, like probably. pirate ships, you know, see skull and crossbones to strike fear into your enemies. That's a very... This is the long-tailed, or tadpole, tank, which has yes. actually got an extension on it. It's designed to actually to go over the trenches of the Hindenburg line, which are actually slightly wider than normal ones. Uh, I don't think it was a great success because it had structural problems with it being so long, I believe. It's very long in shape. I can see it's very narrow at the back. I can't tell the front and the back. Is, is, that, the, is that the back? The oh, yes, yes. That's the back. And then the, and then, oh, yeah, the gun's fight facing forward at the front, yeah. So the back's very narrow and then the, it's wider at the front. All very interesting designs. They also made smaller tanks as well later in the war called the Whippet and the Hornet and the, these pictures show them um, that's the uh, assembly line at uh, Foster's Works uh, which was on Firth Road roughly where Morrison's is now is that what? Morrison's supermarket but the, the Tritton the tritt Road that sort of thing. yes yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and George V and Queen Mary visited um, Lincoln actually in 1918 and here they are actually at Foster's Works uh, they're a uh, Foster executive so we've got, got King George V and um, May, May of Tech isn't it yes it is, May of yeah. Tech yeah his, his consort. So which which tanks were the best? Like as you say, we've got, I'm looking at a Renault tank, and there's also a few made by Foster's. Obviously, Britain pioneered tanks, and they were certainly superior to the German A7V, which was very heavy and cumbersome, although it was heavily armed. But certainly, the Germans used to capture art when they captured them. They would put them back into service. Uh, so I suppose that's quite a good recommendation. Well, that speaks a lot uh, for itself. Yeah, but the little Renault tank was very advanced because it's got a turret on the top, like a modern-day yeah. tank, and it did enjoy quite a bit of success. I mean, I can see most of those either turret up, either built into the front or was on the sides. Yeah, the Renault is quite modern in that respect. So looking, I'm looking at here pictures of various warplanes that um, various companies in Lincoln made. We have the Ruston Farnborough, the BE-2D biplane here. We also have a Ruston Farnborough BE-2C biplane. These are armed with um, bombs and or uh, what they just used for reconnaissance. The BE-2 is actually designed as a reconnaissance aircraft actually. So uh, it would be attached to a camera and... Um, uh, yes, it would probably have a camera who's on reconnaissance duty, yes. Unfortunately, as an aircraft, it was quite slow and not very manoeuvrable, so actually it was quite easy meter for the German fighters. The Russians did make some of um, Britain's better aircraft, like the Strutter and the um, sort of Camel as well. And it wasn't actually just Russians that used to make aircraft. Um, Clayton and Shuttleworth also built yep. a large number of aircraft, um, some of which were built at the Titanic work, which is still still survives today. Uh, yeah. And they both <coughs> built Camel and the triplane, and also the handy page bomber as well, A400. And I see a picture of the, is that the factory workers yes, assembling. Yes, it is. Actually, this volume um, shows what Rustons made during the First World War to promote the war effort. Rustons were the first Lincolnshire company to make aircraft, and they actually built more than any other Lincolnshire company. And I think they built 2,000 aircraft in total and 3,000 aircraft engines as well. In fact, I think they made more aircraft engines than any other British company ever in the First World War. Lincoln is probably the largest manufacturing centre for aircraft in the First World War, in Britain at least. Yeah. Because we've got, there are three companies making aircraft, 
Clayton Shuttleworth, Ruston and Roby. So. Uh, in the case of the Saltworth Camel, Ruston makes 1,600 of them, which I think is more than any other companies. The other thing they made was a lot of diesel engines for some marines. Uh, the Camel was introduced in 1917. It's certainly one of the best fighters on the Western Front. Incredibly manoeuvrable, although it was particularly fast. What was its top speed? They do about 115 miles an hour. Even the fastest second, First World War fighter track, I can only do about 130 or so. I'm trying to figure out, was it made from what material was it made from? What sort of uh, metal? Well, they've got a um, wood and metal frame and then it's covered in linen, then covered in dough. What was dough? The treatment mixture that uh, hardens and hardens the canvas and makes it water impermeable. Oh, I see. So it's, um, so it's like a varnish. Yeah, it's... that sort of thing. It's, oh, it's, so it's, made from, it's not made from metal, it's made from wood. Uh, quite a lot of the fuselage is made of wood and the wings, you know, I mean, parts of it are obviously metal, uh, like the engine mount. It's so. just that you can't really see from the um, black and white photographs. No, no, a lot of the frame is certainly wood. That's why it's deceiving, it looks very shiny, so you think it's metal. Oh no, the what you can see there is actually dope. It, uh, canvas yeah, that's but that, that's varnish. Um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, the area behind the cockpit, that's a metal section. And the propeller and... Um, well, the propeller's wood, actually. Uh, so. Oh, all these were made from wood. One of the aircraft that Clayton Shuttleworth built is the, is the aircraft that um, Roy Brown was flying when he shot down the Red Baron, or allegedly shot down the Red Baron. Some people <laughs> thought, think he was brought down by ground fire. But, but anyway, Roy Brown was flying a solid camel built by Clayton Shuttleworth. That introduces a, a song in a sense, because this is about farming. My name Fred Dobson, Lincolnshire dialect poet, wrote this many donkey's years ago. And a, a singer from down that area, a singer of today named Brian Dawson, thought up a, a tune that would fit it and made it into a song. It's called Not In at the Wall. It has to do with the days out on the Lincolnshire Walls farming area. Before there was a lot of farm machinery and practically everything was done by hand and there was a lot of bending and stretching, bending your back. And they called it nodding at the wall, you see. Some work's done by horses, some gets done by windmills. On the walls, machines drift by a waterfall. On most farms you'll find though all that tedious labour done by country jarskins, nodding at the wall. Nodding at the wall, I nodding at the wall. Hate it like it lumpy. For many of the companies, like Foster's and for, for Dawson's and Penny and Porter's, who had civilian work, that civilian work was very important during the war as well. Traction engines, threshing machines, parts for threshing machines, we still needed to eat, we still needed to do the farming. So all that had to be done as well. They had to keep all those civilian contracts running. And if you look at the Foster books or the Ruston books for the, for the First World War, they do actually build threshing machines and, and traction engines and so on during the war, as well as their military contracts. And when you look at people like Ruston's, a large company, they made all sorts of things, absolute huge amount of military contracts, from aircraft to munitions, all sorts of parts for the tanks, all sorts of things. The, the First World War... The British soldier, his main ration was bully beef, corned beef, and most of that came from South America. And the Germans did their best to sink as much merchant shipping as they could and tried to starve Britain. So uh, our farming was as important as our military uh, aspect during the First World War, yeah. My kid, but you learn to lump it. Get your centre gate at nodding at the wall. Nodding but what about the legacy of these efforts? With it happening 100 years ago, is it now a timely moment to put aside the horrors of the war and instead remember the bold spirit of pioneering engineering in Lincolnshire? Joe Cook, the chairman of the Lincoln Tank Memorial Group, definitely agrees with this. Yes, some work's done by horses, some gets done by windmills. My name is Joe Cook and I'm the chairman of the Tank Memorial Group. What we want to do, we want to show the people of Lincoln that their heritage should be on a roundabout in Lincoln. And we're looking to put on a two-day effect on the roundabout on Triton Road to celebrate our engineering skills here in the city of Lincoln. This grand history changed the, the tide of war, especially the First World War, 
that would have gone on a lot longer and there would have been a lot more men lost if it hadn't been for the engineering skills of this city uh, coming together with Churchill when he wanted a land ship and putting it on the battlefield. It's, it's going very well. We're moving faster than we thought with the application and um, we've got a, a committee that are all putting in a lot of input and even this is our third meeting I think and it's getting better and we've got some really great ideas and I think in many years to come people of Lincoln will be very pleased with our efforts by putting a memorial to the engineering skills of Lincoln on that roundabout on Tritton Road. This audio documentary entitled The Spirit of Lincolnshire Pioneering Engineering was produced, directed and edited by Jake Shears of the University of Lincoln with contributions from Richard Pullen, Adrian Wilkinson, Fred Dobson and Joe Cook. Narration was by Dave Bussey. Jake would like to thank everyone who helped to create this documentary.